I'd like to introduce our team who is presenting tonight. Andrew King is our Chief Legal Counsel in the Southwest Looking Water and Sewer District. Andrew has been an integral part of our team for the last year and a half, and he will be unfortunately moving on this February as he was elected to be judge uh, for the 5th District Court of Appeals. I'd like to congratulate Andrew on the election and wish him luck with his future endeavors. Mike Fromer is, our mid, is the Midwest Strategic Growth Lead for Arcadis U.S. Incorporated. Some of you may recognize Mike as he was a general manager at the Water and Sewer District in the mid, early to mid-2000s. Mike, uh, Arcadis U.S. provides <coughs> leadership, is currently working on a district uh, on project funding applications and drafting a master planning document for the State Route 161 corridor. On behalf of the Water and Sewer District, I'd like to thank Mike for being here with us this evening. Joe Crea is the Vice President of Raftelis. The district utilized Raftelis uh, with Joe's leadership to perform the most current rate study with the district. Based on Joe's recommendations, not only was a customer rate schedule reviewed, but Raftelis took a holistic approach and focused on the tap capacity fee schedule. Again, on behalf of the Water and Sewer District, I'd like to thank Joe for being here this evening. Certainly, the announcement of the Intel Corporation has brought some apprehension and excitement to the Licking County area. With the potential, potential economic boom in western, western Licking County, water, sanitary, sewer, and other utility services have never been more important. The district, along with other utility providers, have been pushing forward with planning, designing, and constructing infrastructure to meet the, the needs of the area since this historic announcement. Access to water, sewer, gas, electric, and other essential services is the foundation to sustainable economic growth. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to servicing this great community in the coming year. Well, good evening. Before I get started, if I could ask something out of the mayor or Scott, I'm going to try to talk loud enough so everybody in the back can hear. If I fail on that, will you please let me know to the top line. All right. Well, I appreciate the introduction, and I just want to take the opportunity to also thank CJ. CJ has taken on a difficult task over the last several years of being the interim general manager and challenging times for the district. I think CJ has done a heck of a job, and CJ's leadership has, has positioned the district for the, for the things we're doing tonight. And what we are doing would not be possible without it. We do also deserve some acknowledgement. So uh, just one other thing I just want to add to what CJ said is we've benefited, I think, from, from Mike's experience both as a consultant and as a former general manager. But Mike spent almost five years as a sanitary engineer and county administrator for Delaware County, and he currently serves on their port authority. So Mike brings about 30 years, 25 years of government and private experience in this county and with a fast-growing sewer system in Delaware County and a fast-growing economic community like Southern Delaware County. So, so what we're going to try to do tonight is cover a little bit of history of the district, where we're at today, kind of where we're going. We'll try to be as detailed as we can, but at the same time keep this accessible to everyone so Maria can write a great story about this that everyone can understand. <laughs> We have a little box up here in front, so we, we did get some questions ahead of time. We had the opportunity to put some of those questions into the presentation for a slide. So I'll, I'll kind of give everyone a warning, but if you have something that comes up and you'd like us to attempt to answer it tonight, and if it's related to water and sewer issues or you know the, the, the substance of the presentation, you can get a maybe a slip from Josephine, or if you have your own, just put it in the basket and we'll do our best to try to answer it tonight before we we leave here. So with that, let's, uh, let's get rolling. So I, it's, I think, useful to sort of talk about how, where did all this come from and how did we get here. So 6119 district is, is set up by the Ohio Revised Code. We are a governmental entity, meaning we submit our budget to the auditor. We're subject to OMA public records request. We're audited. All of that. So we are like your fire district. We're a, a, a taxing unit of government that's independent of all other political subdivisions. But our, our district's a little bit unique in that 6119s are ultimately approved by the court. And when this district was created, there were three entities 
that were tasked with the responsibility of appointing, and that was originally Lima Township, now Patascala, Edna Township, and Harrison Township. So that obviously made sense when at the time that was sort of the, the main core of the, the district and where that was going to serve. So, you know, again, sort of as a, the appointees come, they serve on the board, they, they represent the board and the customers, and they act in, in, the, in the best interest of the district. <clears throat> so even to this day, you can kind of see on the map that the resident, that we still serve the residents of, and businesses of Edna Harrison and Tasco Township. So I don't know, Mike, I mean, you were around for some of the, the early days, but... <clears throat> So this gives you an idea of the current service area. So what you see here is what is the Patascala service area that's agreed to by contract. And then you see the rest of it is the current district service area along with, with the lines here. So what, what you'll notice is there's a couple areas where there's not any major services. Why you see that is because what, what the district has historically done is looked at where growth is wanted and put the resources there. If growth is not wanted, the district has a committed resources. So, but things change. So we, we look at Etna Parkway, that is a project that's underway, and I think construction will potentially begin this year. <clears throat> Summit Road, an extension up to the very boundary of Patascala, is another project that's underway with water and sewer that will begin in the near future. We have it out for, for design. But those are, again, growth areas of Tasco Corporate Park, Tasco Innovation Park. Those are places, and you'll see this later, we know growth is coming. So we are going to do our best to facilitate the growth that the Tasco, in this case, is, is looking for and asking. So this, this is what Mike inherited, right? Yep. So when the district was, was formed, and again, all this is, this is building. I mean, some of you lived through this. I mean, I've... You know, I think I didn't quite live in the county yet, but my wife did. So, but the, back in those days, that was the very beginning of the district, and in that 99-2000 area, the district was engaging in its first expansion to serve all the customers. And that's when everybody loves it, right? The debt elimination fee. Here, who here wants to keep the debt elimination fee? Yeah, that's what I thought, right? So, but that's when this came into being back then because of the need to serve the customers, upgrade the facilities, and there was a, a need to pay for it. <clears throat> so, and the you know, last, we're not shying away from it, the rates were high back then, but we, we get that. <clears throat> so, I mean, yeah, you want to talk about the, what, what you walked yeah, into? Yeah, I mean, this was kind of the dark day, you know, when the EPA had requested the $44 a month, the district had decided to you know, go through OWDA and do the 2070 debt elimination fee. That was an overnight 75% increase in the rates, um, which put the rates at like the max rate in the state of law. Um, and the plan at the time, you know, because obviously there was an outpouring that the rates were too high. So the plan that the district put in place, you know, as 2000 going into 2001, was to grow the system. But there were areas that the townships at the time and the, the city didn't want to grow. Um, you know, there, there was a desire not to. So kind of adopted the mantra to grow where growth was wanted, okay? And you're gonna see throughout that you capture the development revenues um, of the tap <coughs> fees, but then you also increase your customer base and monthly service revenue. So it is kind of a model that you know growth can can help the affordability of the rates as long as it happens in the right spot. And and it was mentioned on the previous slide, but I think it's particularly germane here. Is in, in the early days of the district, anybody that sort of lived out in the early growth areas, you might have seen an assessment on your tax duplicate. So what, what the district did back then was they did not assess system-wide improvements. When we went back to double check this, so what was assessed was only a portion of a portion. So what happened is eventually when that caught up to what happened here. So part of the reason that assessments don't calculate into what the district is doing today is it was a model that didn't quite deliver 
and brought us to this moment in time. Is that a yeah? The, traditionally, the assessments are in unsewered areas where you have a lot of homes that are on septic tanks, and they're very condensed homes. So you assess by the front footage and by the the ERU. When you start spreading the system through like rural land to get to those pockets, it you don't assess fully, and that's what makes it um, difficult. And really, the, the development tech fees and the other strategies are more effective in those areas, facing the type of project. And, and we sort of talked about it, too. I mean, a little bit of density is, is necessary for the assessment. So if it's you don't have houses and stuff to assess, you end up with a lot of agricultural type assessments, which then they're deferred. And it creates a whole other host of issues. So you know, the, at this point, the district was sort of beginning its transition. And, and Mike, I know you can speak to this more than I can from sort of this rural, small system into the more regional type system that everyone's more familiar with today. <clears throat> so that, that brings us to sort of the first phase here. So what, what the district did in this not quite first decade of the 2000s is that's when the Gale Road expansion happened, the York Road treatment plant um, was brought into service. Prologis, again, that was another place where development was wanted was at and at now <laughs> Prologis and Mike built that beautiful water tower. Then you Mike? <clears throat> In nine months. <laughs> the needs, uh, the needs there. So you know the district was very much responding to the needs of the customers, the desires of the township who set and the well, ultimately the task was who set the comp plan and the zoning and who were the ones in charge of the economic incentives. So that led us so you see some of the growth areas that, that we went into, but also the, that the district began its regional collaboration back then. I mean, I know I've, I've, there's been some questions like, where's, where's this coming from? I mean, the district back then went out to the old Dow site the, when Longenberger purchased it and began servicing out there in Granville Township. Jardine Manor was, a, was a, I think, sewer district seven for that the county established that the district took over wholesale, demoed out the package plant and brought a higher level of service there. And then Jefferson Township is a relationship that exists till today, where we, we work with Jefferson Township to provide them some of the water they need, and I think we sewer some of their a little piece of, of Jefferson Township. So even back then, the district was looking for places where there was a need, and the district could fill. And there was a, an okay general manager at that time. <laughs> So, I mean, that, that kind of brings us to, to this slide, is what, trying to visually represent what that growth meant for the customers. So Mike, why don't you tell us what, yeah. what the slide means. So, sorry, engineer, charts, graphs. Um, well, there's plenty of charts in here. Maybe it's Joe's influence <laughs> on me. But everybody cares about what the rain is. I mean, that's what it, you know. This is based on 4,000 gallons of water and sewer usage. Okay, in 92, the rate started at 23.50. Okay, very low. This is when the debt elimination fee in 99, that 75% increase, it went up to 52.37. Then, during that 2000 to 2007, um, you can see where the rates pretty much stayed consistent. Um, the housing recession hit in like 2007, 2008. Um, there was an increase in the rates, but it was also, I think, the minimum switch from 2000 or from 3,000 to 2,000, um, and then it, it went to 72.15, and the rates today are only 30 cents more. Um, I got to tell you, when you look at that, what can you buy today for the same prices as in 2009? We were going to put a thing about eggs because aren't eggs like seven dollars right now? But anyway. The, the other graph on here is the tax. Um, the, this, this black dash line is the number of connections, the new connections the district had. And you can see there's a pretty direct correlation to once the 5237, you can see that, and then when the housing recessions you know, slowed down, there was that initial um, concern over the development revenues, so that the rates were increased. So, but you can see long term and, and Joe was helping us look at, you know, that since 2000, it's been a 1.4% increase, and since 2010, there's been no increase. 
Um, and when you look at the consumer price index, it's, it's about 2.5%. So the district's rates have been lower, and you can see that development <coughs> really impacts um, in a positive way the, the, the and you're going to see later on that you get that first connection fee, but then you also increase your customer base. And I, and I think it's fair to say, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, that I mean, there, there is, you can see, broadly speaking, there's an inverse correlation between when there is a good economy and the district is growing and there's new connections and new taps versus when there's a contraction or very little growth and the, the customer sh shoulder a bigger burden of that load is that. So what does this tell us? Yeah, so the, dark, the top line is the max Ohio rates. The orange line is the Southwest Licking Water and Sewer District. The, the medium blue is 75 percentile, and the light is the, 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 the average. Um, you can see that the district rates started off really close, and you know in the early 90s was about average. But then you can see this is when the debt elimination fee went, went almost up to max rates. You know the district held pretty you know, you know, pretty consistent and actually moved back towards the 75th percentile. And then since 2010, you can see that orange line is diving this way. And the cost of water and sewer, like, throughout the state has gone up quite a bit. Um, so you can see that the district is on a really good trajectory um, to keep those rates, you know, and, and, you know, within short order should be closer back to the 50 percentile um, or the Ohio average. So. And I, you know, I, I think this is another way of stating essentially what we said elsewhere, and you'll hear again, is that when the district is able to leverage its growth and its size for, it, it does it to the benefit of its customers, its rate payers. That. So if you wanted another chart, you got another chart. <laughs> So tell us, Mike. This is Joe's. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're looking the wrong way. I was going to say to anyone that's still I talk about expense. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Andrew woke you all up there. But, um, you know, one more graph here. You know, we were looking at the typical bills that households pay. This is, you know, what the district realized in terms of annual revenue from those different sources. Right? So the bottom, the, the maroonish red, that's our service charges. The monthly bills that customers are paying. How much revenue do we receive from our customers? Uh, the, the little orange bar in the middle, that's the debt elimination fee. You can see it is a, a meaningful component of our annual revenues, but it is not an overwhelming <coughs> number and it has kind of reduced as that charge has changed in recent years. But I think more important, and it kind of echoes what Mike has said a couple of times, is that during those high growth periods, you can see the first one there from 2000 to 2007, uh, a very substantial amount of revenue is coming in from those tap and capacity fees which is creating annual revenue, which allows us to pay for projects without borrowing. It allows us to kind of help reinvest in the system and fund that growth. After that period, and you can see, remember from the earlier chart, there weren't many new connections, and you can see it from 2007 or 8 up to about 2016 when growth was lower. That revenue is smaller, but our user charge has increased. So we added those connections, and a few years later, they're customers, so we've got a recurring revenue from those customers which helps us in perpetuity. And now you can see in the last few years, the growth has begun to resume. We're seeing that tap and capacity fee number increase back to the sort of historic levels. Um, and we're looking forward to that kind of continuing in the future to help offset future service charge increases going forward. We'll be talking more about that just a little bit later in this presentation. So if you can, Joe, I mean, what, why did this chart, or why did this data support the reducing and proposing potentially eliminating the DE is that Yeah, yeah, you know, so kind of stealing the wind for my sales for my future. Oh, I I and I'm out. sorry. <laughs> no, so, so our, our rate study that we just completed did recommend eliminating the debt elimination fee, phasing that out over a period of two years. Primary reason is that the, the additional revenue that we're getting from development and from growth makes that no longer necessary. The other thing is that the, the debt that those charges are associated with are falling off of the books. So we're kind of clearing the slate. Uh, we, we no longer need that because we've got such great growth opportunity and also kind of that liability has been removed from, from the district as well. I'll try not to steal it. Okay. Do you want to do my slide? No, no, no. You look great. So the upshot of this, 
If you're looking for a quote, Maria, growth is good. <laughs> so, what you see here is during this period to now is, first of all, this side of the slide shows that there's unprecedented state and federal funding available right now. And the district has been very aggressive in seeking and receiving that funding. So we've received ARPA grants from, from the state and the county. We've worked with um, the Congress to get some money through um, the federal EPA. It's a stag program. So, you know, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's other money in there that goes out to the high EPA through sort of subgranting and, and, and those sorts of things. And then we continue to see it not only outside the district, but in the current district, some growth opportunities. I mean, um, you'll see the, the dot here. There's some mixed use being proposed in, in Aetna. We have some manufacturing that's going to continue in, in, in Aetna. And, you know, one of the things that, that, that's been good for the district has been the, the low interest rate environment that maybe it's not it's good to tell anymore. But, <clears throat> so, you know, th this was why it brought us to the precipice, and that's why I had to jump ahead to sort of why, why we looked at the TAP fees, capacity fees, and the DE. So, Mike, do you? Yeah, I mean, just, you know, I, I've been involved in working with water and sewer in Ohio for 25 years, and there's more money available now than there ever has been. Um, and it's real dollars. It's not just, you know, small programs like Ohio Public Works. It's, you know, there's 1.3 billion that the Ohio EPA has been given over a five-year period that's 790 million of it's going to be given in principal forgiveness. Um, and then also, you know, when you look at the statewide, um, from the state level, um, you know, the, the mega projects like Honda and the Intel site have reached almost $100 million in, in infrastructure, and water and sewer has been the key, you know, on those projects for the water and sewer. Sure. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let Mike explain this, but I, I, again, I think what you can see here is that a, a strong customer base with strong tap fees is, is where yeah, it's, it, it's you know, once again um, from 2000 to 2007, 40% of the, the, the revenue was coming from tapping capacity fees. Traditionally, systems that don't grow have to budget 100% of their revenue coming from their service charge. So, you can imagine had that growth not happened, that the district rates would have had to gone up even more. In 2008, when the growth slowed down, it's good that the new connections were there because the service charges were 78%, so they had to kind of carry that load during that non-growth. We're starting to see in 2017 and 2022 that tick up in tap fees and capacity fees, which the other charts. And once again, it's why I think the district has started to look at reinvestment of some infrastructures to spur growth because of the timing. To have invested a bunch of infrastructure dollars during 2018 to 16 would have been not the right time because the growth was not you know, coming. The, the other thing that, that the district has been doing very strategically, which some of you know, has been looking for uh, partnering with local governments on additional revenue sources such as tax jets, NCA, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, more later. But again, with, with what Joe has been doing and what we've been looking at is that having ways to lower the overall burden on the customers is desirable. So whether that be through tap fees or through other revenue sources, that's partly how we, we keep the rates low on the individual customers and through the system improvements that, that we've talked about. So that kind of brings us to today. What is underway? What's the district doing? And so now you kind of have the why of it. Why is the district Look, approaching things this way, why is it thinking about this this way, and why is it good for the customers? So, you know, we've got, we're looking at expanding Yale Road, which was the old, the, the original district uh, wastewater treatment plant facility. York Road, uh, we've required additional water well fields, upgrading that plant to essentially its as-built capacity. Um, I mentioned the potassium corporate park sewers, the Broad Street improvements. We've looked at Wagram, which uh, you know we're in the process of design, and we've begun the, the water main extension along Worthington Road and, and 310 to, to further water Jersey Township. So, and I mentioned this earlier, so this gives you some real numbers. I mean, what the district has done, and again, this is this this is how we can leverage our scale and our our position as a regional provider to go get 
significant money for projects. $4.2 million for the Jasper Corporate Park. I know you could read it, but I just want you to hear it. $2.4 million from the county for various projects, including the 161 Water Tower, and another $2.1 million <coughs> for the 161 Water Tower, which brings that project to almost completely paid off by grants. Not all the way, but mostly. And then we've, we've, we're applying what Mike mentioned. We've got historic federal money flowing into the state. So we've been, we've been very aggressive in seeking funding through the Ohio EPA. So when you put all this together, <coughs> The district stands to get over, you know, depending on what the EPA does with their applications. I mean, potentially it's it's almost what 16, 20 million dollars worth of, of grant money that's going to go into the system, and that'll go into the, to Union Township, that'll go into Jersey Township, that'll go into the the existing system in uh, Harrison and uh, and uh, Tasco. So, and I mentioned it. So the we've talked to Kirkersville about extending water service there. You know, we feel that's a win-win for a community that has some water quality issues, some failing wells, those sorts of things. 161, I mean, that's that's a long-standing agreement with the commissioners, and we're obviously, and everyone in this room knows there's growth coming up in that area. And then Union Township, I mean, we'll talk about it more later. I mean, the growth out in Luray has been talked about. Was, was growing out in the Luray talked about when you were? I mean, it's been talked about for 20, 25 years at least. And through this strategy, the district found a way to make it affordable. Mike, you have So here's, here's some of the growth areas we identified. I, I sort of stole a little bit of thunder of this. And you'll see in the Tascala area, that's the Tascala Corporate Park and Innovation Park, we're see, expected growth. And that's why we're getting some sewer improvements in there. So we got a couple of developments in the, the Etna area. The one big one potentially being the high point which is on the east side of 310. And then sort of the, the newer emerging one in Harrison, and, and I think this story is, is, is right on point. You know, Harrison, this is where they want growth. So we're working with the developer and hopefully the township on how to provide for that and keeping with the spirit of new customers paying for new service. But that's an area that we didn't just start running lines and try to do things and force growth on Harrison. No, I mean, this was, a, this was very deliberately zoned and, and planned for by Harrison. So, you know, that's, that's where we see the current growth areas in the, in the footprint of the, the historic service area. So, you know, with the, with the, this gives you a little bit of sense of the, the regional collaboration, sort of the Union Township service area, the Jersey area, um, and, you know, the 161 area. So, you know, we, we know growth is coming. And part of what we'll talk about the master plan later with. I mean, what, what I love about this map is the Patascala service area. Now, understanding that that doesn't have the, you know, the carve out for Patascala, that's almost bigger than Dublin, Westerville, and Worthington when you look at it geographically. So when you look at the area, the service area, it's a very large service area. There's a lot of growth potential that you know that could happen over time. And I mean, since, since you mentioned it, I think one of the things we're pointing out here is. The district, and I, I know CJ is an expert at this, I mean, we're, we're used to covering large distances to get to places. I mean, that's something we do as a regional water and sewer provider. So it's, it's continuing with, with what we're good at. So this is kind of the other maps. You get a little bit of flavor of a little bit more drilled out detail of what's going on in the Ray, and a little bit more detail with Jersey and the 161 service area. So this is where I, I'm kind of excited to talk talk about this. Aren't you Aren't you excited, Roger? I'm excited to talk about it. So again, like I, I think this is a great win-win story, and this encapsulates what the district has been trying to do with this approach. This has been an underserved area that has been targeted for development, and now with Intel coming in 37, possibly being a major thoroughfare for for Intel-related traffic. Union Township wants to be able to grow there. They want to be able to control there. They want to fend off annexation and keep that as part of the township. So how do you do that? Well, I mean, zoning only gets you part of the way, but you work with the district to establish water and, and sewer. So what, what we did here to sort of get the ball rolling was Union Township established Tiff in the area, sort of, they've tipped all the parcels in the area, we worked with Union Township, 
to then have an agreement to use those tips for, for revenue to pay for these things. Union Township also established a JED, and, and then the last hearing is what, tomorrow night? Tonight. I'll say it. Right now. Earlier tonight. Oh, so that's, we're all done? We're all done. We're all done. So the JED is established, the, right? the public hearings are done. The public hearings are done. So, so and, and I think that JED was a, was a huge win-win for Union Township and the district, but I think particularly Union is well positioned not only to protect its borders, but get some revenue out, out of that for additional projects. <coughs> so, you know, what started as a water project quickly became, hey, we're going to need sewer. So then, you know, we, we kind of looked at how real roughly that sewer could go in there. But I think knowing what, what Union and the district did was put this relationship in place where there's a, a method to pay for these public improvements that then allows future revenue to come in. And so the water project will go into construction this year, and then the sewer will, will, will trail behind that. But, but even though we have this relationship with Union, and when we've approached Kirkersville, like we are still in the process of applying for funding for that from the EPA. So, you know, if, if both projects get funded, that's potentially four and a half million dollars of grant money that can go towards, I, I, you know, I know days here, but I mean, I think Kirkersville really could, could benefit from the water, and I think Union definitely wants the water out there. So again, I mean, it's a, it's a great win-win story, I think, and, and a great story of how growth can support growth and how the district can help these local governments maintain their integrity and find new revenue sources that otherwise would be denied to them. If you want to. <coughs> so the 161 area is, is the other area that the district has obviously been looking at. So, you know, I don't know, half a decade ago, thereabouts, and we were trying to establish it the other night. Right, the, the agreement was put into place and then the district began running the water <coughs> up to, to 310 and uh, Worthington Road. <coughs> so the next phase of that project is we'll go into construction this year and then the design of me will, will happen shortly after that. The water tower is in design, we'll go into construction probably next year. So, you know, that again, well on the way to serving a community in an area that expects growth and wants growth. And then, um, you know, you see sort of the summit extension on here as well that for the water and sewer up Summit Road. So, I don't know, Mike, do you have anything else that you want? No, this is, uh, you know, this this initial plan is one that gets serviced in the area. Clearly, what was put in place in 2010 with the commissioners, um, which was originally just like the 161 corridor and some of the interchanges, has taken a different look with the Intel and the Van Trust and, and some of the development that's happening. Um, it, this is a really good way to get service up in that area, but it's going to be probably limited to you know 500,000 to a million gallons. Okay, um, the use the potential users could be much larger than that. So this is a good additional step. There's a lot of funding, um, you know, state funding that's that, that looking at. Um, the next step would be to look at, like, you know, I, I know CJ on, on a daily basis they'll get a request for a million gallons of capacity from hiring users. Just a different, you know, the, it, the development has switched from the logistics manufacturing to the, the tech manufacturing, which is just a, a large demand on water usage. Um, and then also, you know, JEDs and TIFs for, for non-residential. Um, you know, there's a lot of confusion regarding those. Um, you know, I've personally been involved with probably 10 of them in my time in Delaware County. And they're very specific things based on the development. Um, people talk about them broadly, but they're, they're different ways to fund regional infrastructure. Sometimes they are assigned to the developer to build. Sometimes they are used by the, the government entities for road and other regional infrastructure. You know, you got to be really careful because on the TIFs, when the schools are part of it, you got to make sure that the, the student usage and the property values, JEDs are, are when you have larger businesses that have a lot of, you know, future jobs, but aren't, but you're in a competitive nature to incentivize them to come. So they're, they're very specific. I hear a lot of people that, you know, yeah, they're, those really are more of a, a very specific thing for a unique situation. So. 
Well, and I think what two things I'd take this opportunity to sort of one question that I'll just go ahead and answer now and then just expand upon what you said is that, you know, what, and I think Mike, you can speak to this with your experience in Delaware County and you know, you've had experience around this, the state and country, is what we've typically seen in the past is developers come in and request TIFs for their own water and sewer infrastructure. They build it to public specifications and dedicate it back. Typically, that's roads, water and sewer projects. Occasionally, it could be other things, but that's typically what we've seen. So the, what the district did a little bit differently here over the last two years was instead of being reactive and waiting for the developer to come and on a one-off parcel build one specific improvement, try to look at it as, as a region or as an area and say, where do we expect growth to come? Can we work with the local government to proactively put those tips in place and not wait for the developer to go there and put the water and sewer infrastructure in so that when, when uh, you know, Grow Looking County or whatever has a lead, they can say, yes, we've got some place that, that water and sewer is ready. The other thing which, you know, I don't think anybody I don't think you asked this question exactly, but I got a question along this, this line, was sort of what, if there's negative impacts to the school on, on TIPS? And, I, and I, I mean, that's a kind of an evergreen question, right, Mike, that like, comes up all the time, and then you touched on it a little bit. And I, and I think, you know, where the district's at is they're, they're welcome, if they're willing to work with the local governments on that, and I think, I think all the local governments in this room are sensitive to when the school districts concerned about student generation numbers and nothing that the district has been doing or promoting has been an attempt to undercut the school on its ability to fund new students by way of Yeah, no, it, it, there's, not a, there's not a school su superintendent in the state of Ohio that can't tell you what it costs to educate a pupil. I mean, anyone can, they'll say 11,000, you know, whatever it is. And you just have to look at what the estimates are on student population. Because you know, most times the land is currently in an agricultural state, so that they're not giving property tax. The, the schools are not giving property tax or very minimal property tax. So you just have to look at and run the, the you know, because because once again, what makes a community desirable for development is the schools. I mean, let's face it. That's like the number one criteria. You know, if you're going to have new employment, you want people that move to the area and they want to feel comfortable putting their kids in the school. So it really goes hand in hand. And yeah, there are deals that if you do the wrong deal on it, it could have a negative impact, but that's why you have to look at each thing specifically. Sure, and I mean, again, when you give general information, you get sort of general answers. But I mean, I, one of the things to sort of keep in mind is that in the absence of water and sewer, most things in this county are of any size are CAUV, and they're have a, have a very favorable property tax associated with that. Once water and sewers in the area and the property is put to its highest and best use, which with water and sewers often something commercial, retail, manufacturing, that comes out of CAUV, comes up to market value, and even before an improvement's put on the property, there's a there's a net benefit to all the taxing authorities, including the school. So even when, and then you, once there's an improvement, there's still a benefit to the school. So again, like I, I think it all becomes. What's the specific deal and what's the specific development? All right, I'm back. <laughs> um, so I, I stole your first point. It's right there. And it I, is. And I stole well, I've already said it, so I'll skip it. Um, we recently completed a rate study over the last year for the district. Um, so what that is, that's a pretty comprehensive study where we look at what are all the current needs of the system from you know operating in all of our annual operating costs, to pay for power bills, pay salaries, etc. What does the customer base look like? How many cows do we have? What's our growth rate? How much water do people use? So we can understand both sides of that equation, what our costs are and what our revenue is. Um, you know, a lot of information went into that and certainly one of the key drivers is all of the capital improvement work that we've heard a lot about today. Um, so that's a little bit of a moving target as we're kind of working in a very dynamic situation. But at the end of the day, we kind of came with what's the best information that we know right now for what growth is going to look like over the next 5, 10, 20 year period. And we try to put that into a forecast. And the chart you're seeing on, on the screen is, is sort of a very high level summary of what that looks like. Is we, we see our revenues are increasing over time as we move into that growth oriented period that we talked about earlier in our presentation. So we can continue to see strong growth in our customers as we've made these improvements to extend infrastructure to new places. 
Along with that, our, our costs have to increase, uh, but we have the revenue to support that. And the thing to notice here is, is this revenue increase, it's kind of dramatic because it's looking out over a 20-year period and very much a crystal ball when you, when you move beyond you know, a five to 10-year period. But uh, it is based on rate increases that are below the industry average for what we see across the country, around 25 to 3% per year. That's kind of the baseline that we have in there Again, placeholder at this point. We have growth from our customers. We have a balanced way to fund that capital improvement work. We're, we're using loans from the state with all of the, the programs that were mentioned in terms of principal forgiveness and money from the federal government. Uh, we have some allowances for uh, those TIF and JED partnerships that were just talked about. And we're, we are maintaining a large amount of our capital program is funded with cash. So that annual tap and capacity fee revenue that we're generating is going right back into our system to help eliminate and reduce whatever our, our borrowing obligations are going to be. So we've got a very comprehensive plan. Again, it, it kind of changes um, you know, every six months as we get updated bids. And inflation's at 9%. Um, so we're, we're, we're actively and dynamically kind of managing that. A couple of things to note. Uh, across the industry, you know, what's typically defined as sort of a high burden water and sewer bill is when it, that monthly cost represents 4% of a typical household's income. Right now, the district's typical customer bill is about 2.75% of median household income for the service area. So we're well below that metric, um, you know, just as a, as a point of reference. And again, we'll be continuing to update this as we move forward and, and get better numbers from these master planning efforts. <clears throat> So what the, what the district began late last year was a master planning of both the 161 area and the current historical service area. So Arcadis was selected to do the master planning for the 161 area. So Mike, why don't you sort of tell us what, yeah. what that's entailed, what you've done, what we got to look forward to. Yeah, the, you know, the, first, the first step was kind of finalizing that short-term plan that we shared earlier, okay? Um, you know, was how to get water and sewer in that area to take care of the immediate needs, you know, with the growth and development. Next was, and, and we've completed kind of looking at the long range plan for water and wastewater, okay? Um, capacity. You know, there needs to be, um, you know, the amount of water, um, and we, we've determined at this point there's about 10 million gallons of water, you know, for that service area. Um, you know, so that's done. The next step, and, and the community meeting and update works really good, is to start looking at that phase in affordable infrastructure plan. Um, as Joe mentioned, you know, costs have, have escalated. You know, water and sewer capacity is very, you basically have to encumber and borrow the money and build it, then you sell it to the, the new customers, okay? So, we will look at various, you know, and it's really just depending on the needs of the area, kind of a phase and affordable plan. As we've shown you, the district's system has developed, you know, incrementally, you know, getting capacity over the years, and we'll take a look at that stuff. And, and once again, whether it's, you know, and some of that's going to be based on the development planning, the horizon, you know, there's a lot of people from an economy standpoint, it feels like we're on the, the cusp of a recession right now, but Central Ohio seems like it's gonna pull through, at least on the manufacturing side. So we're gonna look at all these different options. You know, some of them may not be very desirable because it'll give CJ more pump stations and stuff to maintain, but they'll be short-term solutions just to make sure that the district doesn't get in over its skis, you know, on dead service with no uh, tapping. The, the development needs to help the district with the debt revenue and monthly revenue, you know, service revenue, and but not put it in a position to to have to increase. Um, once again, I, I mentioned earlier, there's this is once in a lifetime funding opportunities, and it's at the state, local, you know, level. There's been more investment in Ohio, um, you know, from an economic development standpoint, and there's there's 5,000 acres of prime manufacturing land that's within the district services. Okay. Um, the economic development infrastructure, <coughs> we talked a lot about that. 
they're very specific things based on a certain type of development. They're not a broad brush. Um, we're going to look at those. Um, one thing we haven't talked about is capital recovery and surcharges, uh, local infrastructure oversizing. You know, you know the the uh, residential developers. Ron doesn't want to hear this, but sometimes you can have them oversize infrastructure. You know, in housing developments to help the overall system and reduce future projects. Um, capital recovery. Um, if there's certain infrastructure that's going to help a certain area, you can put in, you know, surcharges. There's, there's a million, Joe and I could probably, you wouldn't want to hear it because you'd be so bored. We could sit for, you know, an hour and talk about all the different ways. Whatever the district, you know, board wants to do and how they want to approach it, we can come up with a way. So whether it's small little incremental steps to capacity, the problem with that is you're, you may lose some of those big users. Um, you know, which could really have a big impact on the, the local economy. Um, and then once again, we do everything from a detailed financial analysis. Um, everything has to pass muster, you know, and be able to be, a, you know, um, to be afforded. So it's, you know, once again, the next six to nine months, you know, working through this is going to be, um, you know, uh, we're going to be getting through all this stuff, and there's a lot of options and different things like that. So. You know, what do we usually do? Like four scenarios, and then I ask you for two more, and that's about yeah. Time. I mean, so there, there's going to be a lot of different funding. There's a lot. <laughs> like anything, there's a lot of you know. You need to look at things and see how it's going to play out, and, and look at worst case scenario with the economy, things of that nature. So, so before we run on the next slide, there's just maybe two things that I, I want to touch on. I'm going to run the phase and affordable infrastructure. We got a question about when. <coughs> Wastewater treatment plant would would under would, would begin construction sort of in the 161 area, and that's part of what we're looking at is how do we face this in an affordable way, and that dovetails with the second thing. Many of you have seen me come to your meeting over the course of last year because as we're looking at these regional type services, trying to have multiple partners engaging on this through TIFs and GEDs and NCAs reduces the overall cost to a single entity. I mean, Roger could probably tell you if there was two or three other governments that they could spread the cost of that around on, they'd love to do it. So, I mean, that's something to keep in mind as, as we're going through this. We were, we were, we've reached out to try to solve regional problems with regional partners and using regional money. So the, the other master planning, and Mike can speak to this, is, is sort of in the current historic service area. And again, we're, we're not ignoring that area. Yeah, and this one's a different, you know, the other one's kind of a clean slate. This one is, you know, as Andrew showed at the beginning, you have the one with the orange dots. You know, you have, the district has a sewer and water system already set with Potasco Corporate Park, the Innovation Park. We, you know, the, there needs to be a master plan to look at the downstream impacts. At the end of the day, you're either pushing water out to a development or you're bringing the stuff back on the other end, okay? And so we need to make sure that those types of growth, you know, because once again, the manufacturing has switched. It's gone from a logistics to more of a water using, uh, you know, technology-based type system. So we need to look at that. You can see there was quite a few projects, you know, creating the main water plants and things like that. So this will be more of a, a confirmation of, of some of the plans on the books right now. Um, but once again, leveraging some funding opportunities that are out there, and then you know doing the, the whole financial analysis. What Joe completed in 2002 or 22 will be uh, um, you know updated to to reconfirm the affordability of it and the financial impact. Okay. Um, so Joe, I'm back to you. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think Mike was kind of saying it there. We're going to be updating our, our work, our rate study, our financial plan with the, the outputs from the master plan. Uh, you know, we are going to be continuing those dialogues with folks from the state and other funding agencies to make sure we've got a balanced approach to how we're trying to pay for these projects. Um, we have looked at the connection fees and, and rates, where they're at now, and what we've recommended is appropriate. But as new facilities come online, as we have new opportunities to adjust the tapping capacity fees, that will all be considered kind of moving forward. Um, and, and it's my 
I mentioned, you know, this is not going to be there. There's one, only one thing, only one answer. We'll have multiple scenarios that will be discussed and reviewed with the board uh, to make sure that, that everyone has an opportunity to kind of uh, see where, where we're headed. So the future. So as Joe mentioned, the, the plan is to draw down and, and eliminate the debt elimination fee, which I hope if nothing else, people want to be happy about that. <coughs> so, you know, the second bullet point, I mean, I, I think we've tried really hard to explain why growth has been good historically, why we think growth will be good in the future, and how that benefits not only the current customers, but the tax base of all of our local participating governments. And, you know, I mean, taking it out a step further, I mean, I think everyone wants Licking, Western Licking County to be something great. And having worked in Delaware County, I don't think we want it to be another Delaware County. We want it to be something better. And I think the district views our role in that as bringing something better to this county than what, what we've seen elsewhere. And we have to obviously do that in partnership with, with our local governments. And then the master plans and financial plans, we, we've sort of talked about that at length. So before I just turn it over for any final comments on the slides to, to Mike or, or Joe, if you have any questions, get them to Josephine now, please, and then I'll try to do my best to answer them. So Mike, do you have any? Yeah, you know, you know I just, I think it's something where, um, you know, the support of thriving, you know, community, um, you know, there's, what's, what's really interesting or nice about Whoa. He's okay. Chairman down. Chairman. Mark. It's a good thing I didn't say Mark. Mark, you're trying to get another appointment, aren't you? That's what you're trying to do. You know, I, I think I think there's a lot of opportunity and, and a thriving community can benefit a lot. What's great about um, the type of intel development, you know, I have a peer out in uh, Chandler, Arizona, you know, there was a hundred businesses, you know, going in to support. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity. Then you look at the job creation, everybody is going to benefit, whether you're a pizza shop owner in Pataskala, um, you know, housing, you know, you look at the schools and what's really fascinating to me is with the recession starting to hit some of the other areas. I know Delaware County housing is slowing down a little bit in other areas. So I think this is a really good opportunity for for the, this area, Western Lincoln County, Pataskala, Edna, Harrison, um, Jersey, St. All. Everybody can can you know improve. The only thing that'll happen that, that people won't like is the property values will go up and then your taxes will go up to the county. But that's it. I mean that's the only bad thing. But we don't have the commissioners here. Yeah, your property value. But like I said, there's a lot of benefit to everybody. And it's really good to see, you know, this part of the area, I think, in a, in a really good position to, to take advantage of that, you know. The only thing I would add is, you know, I think uh, with as many partners as the district has, it's great to see you all out here on a Monday night in the winter. Um, you know, that kind of engagement and collaboration is what, what's going to be needed to make sure where, where the district heads is what's best for the community as a whole. Well, so I'll flip to it. Sorry. Right. Myself. Uh, the one thing I, I thought I, I would mention, and, and we don't have anyone to call on this in the room, right? Like one of the things that I think we heard over and over again, we have concern about Columbus. So you're laughing. <laughs> so but we've heard over and over about Columbus and it continuing to come into Lincoln County and gobble it up. I mean, I, I remember when that was sort of the impetus behind the Lima Township Tasco merger. And it's something we've heard over and over again. And I think one of the things the district has taken very seriously on the western side of the county is how, how to provide, through water and sewer, the ability for townships to fend off annexations and being in control of their own destiny and not be subject to, to Columbus in the future. So just wanted to add that. See, you can't put that in the dispatch bar yet, because then you know I'm going to get hate from Columbus. It's so a good Mike. Yeah, so, so these were some questions that have been submitted. Um, you know, how does the proposed expansion in Jersey Township impact the existing customers? Well, if, if, done, if done in a manner that's planned out like we talked about, 
it could provide a larger customer base and more opportunity for revenue. It obviously is going to come down to what's going to develop, how to recover the cost, you know, and make sure that it's done in a manner like we showed you earlier within the, the current district of, you know, having it be a positive impact to the customer. Um, how does this expansion benefit the district and not increase debt significantly? The, the debt's going to increase. I mean, infrastructure costs money. Um, the additional revenue in, in economies of scale, you know, the, one of the benefits of being a regional district is the economies of scale. As you get larger, um, your overhead, your administrative costs are spread out. Um, and so it, it just has to outweigh the additional expense. I mean, that's what Joe gets paid to do, to make sure that what is put, it, you know, what is uh, the debt is increasing. You know, why is the $20 million in reserves not used to pay down the debt? It is. I mean, Joe mentioned, uh, you know, there's a bunch of uh, cash. Um, I don't know, it was it? 50% or half or whatever. Yeah, about it. I, I didn't point that out on that slide with the, the line of the bars. I'm sorry. It was areas where the bars exceeded the lines. That's when we were intentionally using our reserves, our cash reserves, to help minimize our, our future borrowing. So we are planning to use that intentionally um, throughout the period. Um, the, uh, you know, will assessments be levied in the new service area similar to the past? You know, that's not currently the plan because most of the development land is, or most of its development land will be developed. Um, assessments, if there were large pockets of existing homes that are on septic tanks, you know, that would be something that would be looked at because that's what was done with, you know, Beachwood Trails and, you know, when you go back into the history of um, the, we, we, it wouldn't be necessarily an effective method, you know, in the future. You want me to hit the button, Mike? Is Please, that... thank you. Bam! Take a couple weeks off, they call you your honor or whatever, which that uh, is going to be. Um, how will the new service area expansion be paid for? Um, you know, first of all, the new funding opportunities. You know, there, like I said, there's a lot of state money out there that, you know, Ohio, the Ohio Department of Development, like I said, is looking at unprecedented funding at the state level. Um, you know, it'll be development revenue, monthly rates, tips, gens, it'll be, you know, uh, a whole, you know, it's, it's going to be very creative and it's going to be, there's going to be no st stone unturned to make sure that all the revenue is being captured appropriately. Um, will outside rate surcharges be imposed for the new customers? You know, traditionally, you know, as I've worked throughout the state, you don't see that surcharge unless it's a city providing to the township areas outside, you know, that you see that surcharge. The district hasn't done that. There's always been a feel to be more, to treat all their customers equally and the same. So that, that hasn't been looked at, but that could be something, a policy decision that the board, you know, looks at again. Um, you know, has a, a, you know, has a, a business plan been prepared to justify this expansion? Um, it has for the initial projects but it'll be, you know, part of the expanded, you know, master plan. Um, you know, or after the master plan is done and we'll take a look at it. You know, there could be tap fee increases, there could be, you know, there, everything's on the board when you look at that. Um, why was Wagro uh, delayed? Um, you know, I, I just, it paid me to put COVID on the slide, but whatever, you know, but it, it did have an impact. Things really slowed down and then the site conditions out there um, there were some environmental site conditions that needed to be mitigated. And, and quite honestly, right now, construction volatility, you know, in the market, too, is something that to, to be looked at, you know, with the supply chain stuff. So we got a different question about the inside, the debris. The so I, I just want to add a little bit more to that to maybe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things that is different, so I, I referenced Early on, Lima Township, Harrison Township, and Etna, all were sort of the original appointing authorities to the district. I mean, based on anything we could find, there was no revenue that was ever transferred from the townships to the district for that. I mean, if you're not aware of anything. So, one of the things that's different about the relationship with Jersey and Union is they're bringing revenue into this and helping pay for the project. So they are buying into the system in a way that no one else did before. So, I mean, if they're doing that, charging them inside the district rates, frankly, is, is only fair. I mean, 
you can certainly take that policy decision up with the board, but that's sort of where it's been to this point, and I think it's reflected in our agreements with those two entities. So, Joe, I know you. Yeah, we got one question about uh, trying to pull up our current balance sheet. Um, don't think we have that on the machine here. Certainly, the district's financial statements and the audit is available on the state's auditor's website. Uh, you know, as part of our study, we did a pretty comprehensive review of the current financial conditions of the district. The district does have a strong financial position relative to other water and sewer utilities around the state and throughout the country. So, um, you know, strong reserves, uh, liabilities currently are relatively low. Uh, of course, you know, we're looking at a period of capital improvement, so that is part of, of what we're going to be looking at, as has been discussed. Uh, currently, the district does have a, a very strong financial position, and you know, we can follow up more detail kind of offline here on, on this question. We don't have the specific balance sheet that we can put on the screen. So, uh, a couple other questions, and, and you two are certainly welcome to give additional commentary or color to it. Um, so one question here was the concern that only Aetna has been, it's only been sought from Aetna to, for, to contribute jet and TIF revenues toward the Wagram plant. I, I don't know that's 100% true. I think there's been some discussion with the task force. So broadly speaking, the western side of the service area will be serviced by the Wagram plant. So I think we'll continue to have those discussions with the municipalities and, and folks that are going to benefit from that improvement. Um, capacity fees. Um, I, I can't remember if we talked about this in the presentation. So, uh, Joe, when, when you studied the, the capacity fees, why were like the capacity fees and tap fees not raised to support this expansion? Yeah, so there is a, a kind of a standard industry, common industry approach for determining what is a fair and defensible cap and capacity fee that you will charge. Um, that keeps the district from kind of being exposed to potential litigation. Um, and so we've completed our study. We did follow that approach, which looks at all of the assets that are in service right now, what the value of those assets is, how much capacity they can provide. We also look forward at upcoming capital projects to see how much they may cost and how much capacity they might provide. When we kind of put it all into the, the big math equation, it yields a kind of recommended maximum fee that you can charge. Um, that fee was kind of right around where our, our current fees are. Might have been a little bit higher. There's a little bit of movement to change it. So we made some adjustments in the 23 rate schedule you'll see to align the capacity fees with that result. As we move forward and as those kind of what we spend on those projects is going to change and how much capacity we add, that calculation can be updated pretty easily. And that'll be something that will factor into a long-term plan and how can we balance revenue from existing customers versus growth to make sure growth is paying for growth um, throughout the period. So there's there's essentially two questions asking sort of about the, the weight room plant in general. So just to kind of give a brief synopsis of that, and CJ, please throw something at the by the state. So we, we're at about 50% design on, on the treatment plant. So we, we are doing a CMAR construction manager at risk type contract. So we've, we've engaged with that, that construction manager throughout the process on, on cost. So the, the exact timing of when the plant's gonna go into construction and potentially come into service and the final cost is subject to the continued discussions between our engineering firm and the CMAR. So I, I think, you know, again, there's been some challenges that, that we're working through, but it's, it's, all, it's all proceeding at the moment. Got a couple more. We got it's almost time for the board, so. Um, we got a question about what is the sewer cost for 161? So Mike, I think you talked a little bit about looking at the phasing and the cost. I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know if you can give a little bit more thought on how you're going to approach probable costs and those sorts of things. So. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be, you know, the, the cost, you know, it, it depends what type of capacity you're looking at. I mean, it's, you know, if, it, if it's incremental, like the smaller, you know, capacities we've talked about, you know, there'll be, there's going to be a, a list of capital improvements that are going to be for more like regional solutions. 
you know, that would be providing higher capacity. And the costs on those are going to be, you know, pretty significant right now. But then there'll be a range um, down. So there's going to be a detailed, you know, capital cost of all those improvements. We don't, all we have is the initial, the short term, which was $26 million um, that was presented here. We'll be working through that. Um, but it, like I said, it's, you know, when you look at 10 million gallons of capacity potentially, that's, I mean, that's a lot of, you know, that's bigger than city of Newark and places like that. So there's going to be a lot of uh, costs associated, but there's going to have to be, there, you know, but it'll be, have to be analyzed and obviously it won't be built overnight. So there's sort of a two questions here. What is is concerned about Johnson's ability to grow and about hurting the, I guess, the village, village, right, city, and the school? Is it a village or city, Sean? City. 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 I could have asked you. Village. City. So, yeah. It's a village all my So, so you know, I touched a little bit on the schools. I mean, a certain amount of development is good for the schools. I think, I think where the rub is. And I think most superintendents would tell you, and I think it's kind of been our experience when we work with folks in Delaware County, and I've seen it repeat here, is that the, the rub really becomes the student generation. And that, I think, again, is something that we do not directly control as the water and sewer district. That becomes more of a zoning and planning matter. But again, I think that's something we, we're working with our local partners on. As far as growing, you know, what, you know, and, and Mike, you're, you're certainly able to speak on this, is that I think the way the district is approaching this is this is truly a once in a lifetime thing. This is going to be a huge regional need that needs to be fulfilled. And there's multiple ways that this could, could go about it being done. And if some cities want to annex and bring those properties into their water and sewer district service, that's fine. Like that's not what we're necessarily trying to do up there is, is harm Johnstown in any way, I think that's a fair statement. I'm more concerned to address it if I say anything that, that is contrary to that. So, you know, I think I think there's an opportunity to co cooperate with our municipalities like Pataskala and Johnstown, and I think there's a, there's an opportunity for everyone to benefit, so I don't want to like Yeah, that. no, I think that, you know, <clears throat> I, I think that when you look at the needs, the potential needs of the desirable you know, uses up there for manufacturing. I think it's going to take both the district and Johnstown to solve that. I mean, you know, <clears throat> when you look at Raccoon Creek, you know, you have the discharge for wastewater and you have the water under the ground. Um, you know, unfortunately, with this type of development we've been talking about, you know, you're talking two, four million gallons a day of water. That's a lot of capacity. You know, and it's going to take full. I think. You know, to say it's one entity or the others, it, the amount, the magnitude that's going to happen is, you know, when you talk that kind of acreage. And I think once, um, you know, when you look at that service area, I think there's going to need to be some collaboration to, to take, you know, it's, like I said, the magnitude is, it's not like serving an area that's just a bunch of logistics. It's going to be, you know, uh, um, I don't know exactly. I'm not at speed 100% on Johnstown, but you know, one user, one user on a 100 acre or 200 acre parcel could take up all their mill, million gallons of capacity, and then going right now, right now could be, you know, 20, 30, 40 dollars a gallon. So that's going to be a lot of expense for one parcel. It's going to take a lot of time to get it. So sorry, I'm kind of. It, it's one of those when you look at the magnitude and you really study what. Um, a, a large industrial user that needs water is going to be, it's going to take a bunch of people. But it's not either or. And maybe, and we, I know we talked about this sort of separately, I mean, is, is it an opportunity for you to comment on sort of how regionalization and scale can help these sorts of things <coughs> financially and development wise? Is that something? I mean, I think I can say that, you know, so we work with 600 utilities a year across the country. In general, large utilities have a cheaper, you know, per unit cost to serve their customers than smaller. You know, it's basic economic theory. Uh, there's always people that blow the curve, but in general, that's that's kind of the, the rule of thumb, and you see that. Um, 
pretty clearly across across the, the water sewer rate industry. So the last slip of paper, you come to it, everyone's stay away. You can't laugh. It's all right. It's all right. Even if they're bad jokes, you can give me a pity laugh. <laughs> Start telling dad jokes, right? So uh, two two questions here. Is it typical to take on more service area before the master plan is completed? I think, and I'll certainly turn this over to Mike, I think um, there's sort of what existed in the 161 area was the longstanding 2010, the service agreements the district has been for many, many years looking at how to, to appropriately service that area. I think when we got some additional requests beginning in 2020 from Jersey to serve more of Jersey Township, that certainly impacted that. Um, and then, you know, to the extent there was some initial concern about the, the Monroe piece, I mean, we looked at that and it sort of leveraging it financially, another lift station could potentially let, let the district do that at a, at a reasonable cost. So, you know, I, I, I mean, if you want to talk about it, but I, I can just kind of say over the last year, year and a half, I mean, with regards to sort of Jersey and that, that Monroe piece, I mean, I think that's sort of what factored into it. I don't know if you... Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, clearly, as we showed initially, that the existing service area um, is getting pretty well covered, you know, with these, these you know, with, once those uh, orange dots get served, you know, there's, there's going to be not a lot of other areas that, that the community wants to grow. So I think, you know, the service area, you know, it, it to expand in there, you know, it's it's the initial infrastructure, but then when you look at how it develops, you know, each of those those infrastructure phases will kind of stand on its own on what land it's going to be, you know, providing, and it's going to have to provide a net positive back to the overall system, you know, to, to make it work. So. So the uh, last question here, Mike, this is, I think you're asked, is are there natural resources available for the new service area that specifically <coughs> aquifers and outfalls? So I mean, what, what sorts of things have you done? You've, you've sort of thrown around some numbers. I mean, you, what, yeah. what have you done to sort of assure that there's the opportunity to both discharge and... Yeah, I mean, you know, we've, we've been looking at a, a very higher level you know, discussion. The, the existing sewer district system, you know, with Wagram being built and some of the stuff, there's been a lot of phases along the way to get there. We took a, a bigger picture, you know, that second bullet item was, you know, where is their water and where is the, the best place to discharge. And it's in Raccoon Creek, but it's further, you know, uh, it's obviously further east. You know, there's a spot in Raccoon Creek where there's, there's a convergence of, of three little uh, streams or runs, I can't think of them off the top of my head right now. And so getting downstream is better from a wastewater standpoint. Um, the technology that you use though, you, you know, you can use more or higher level of technology to discharge a higher flow into, you know, the loading and stuff like that. Um, we've looked at the aquifer, um, we've looked at surface water, we've just looked at all the water resources you know, in that area, and that's where we've come up with the 10 million gallons of water. And it is further um, downstream in, in the aquifer. You know, the, the Raccoon Creek aquifer um, in general is a lot more productive on the uh, eastern side of Alexandria than it is upstream. So. Well, I appreciate everyone's attention. It's very somber and sober. I mean, it's water and sewer, I guess, so it means dignity. So I, I appreciate everyone's attention, and I'll turn it back over to the board now. We're being a special meeting. The only item on the agenda will be the adjournment. So um, if you have any more questions, be sure and get them to us and answer them directly to the email. Yes. Yes, we are